Hello, everyone. Welcome to the room for discussion. Uh, as the threat of climate change looms large, there is an urgent need for us to imagine new tools to help us deal with this crisis. Today, we will be talking to Mr. Kim Stanley Robinson, asking him the follow following question. Can science fiction wake us up to our climate reality? Author of more than 20 books, many consider him to be one of the greatest science fiction writers of our time. The Ministry for the Future follows fictional world leaders, technocrats, and policymakers as they come into contact with the Ministry for the Future, a subsidiary body established to tackle the climate crisis. It weaves together science, economics, and an overarching fictional narrative, and has received high praises from readers such as Barack Obama and Bill Gates. We are honored to have him on our stage today. Please give a big round of applause for Mr. Kim Stanley Robinson. Hi. Hi. Hello. Take a seat. Where's I sit? Have a seat. Okay. Cool beans. Uh, Mr. Robinson, uh, welcome to the room for discussion. Uh, is this your first time in the Netherlands? No, no, but it is a long time since I've last been here. I was, I calculated, and for a lot of you in the audience, this is going to be like uh, I'm the time traveler from the mid 20th century. I was last in Amsterdam in 1987, and it's one of the first cities in Europe I ever landed in in 1977. So, I'm back. Definitely been a while. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is the flatness of this country in general much different to the California landscapes you're used to? Well, I come from Davis, California, which is in the great Central Valley of California, and it is literally flatter than the Netherlands. It's hard to do, <laughs> but it's absolutely the case that the Central Valley used to be a lake or an inner sea filled in with soil, and then earthquakes gently flattening it. And it is as flat as this floor for about um, 100 kilometers wide with us in the middle, and about five or 600 kilometers long. It, if you look at maps, it's the, except for the um, ice cap of Antarctica, it's the biggest, flattest spot on the whole surface of the Earth. So, and I actually don't like that flatness very much, so it's not the main feature of the Netherlands that I would be attracted to. Um, I'm, you know, I would be more interested in Amsterdam and in the dike system, the polders, the North Sea, the rivers, the rewilding projects, almost anything but the flatness, which is dreadful. If you, I mean, 40, 45 years of living in a flat landscape, yeah. it can drive you mad. But I'm picking up a pattern because you you seem to really notice the landscapes and nature and environment and the conservation of it are recurrent throughout a lot of your work. Yeah. Um, do you remember any really early experiences that led you to focus on that in your writing? I definitely do, yeah. I actually grew up in Southern California. I'm from Orange County, which is south of Los Angeles, and then I went to college for 10 years in San Diego on the cliffs of North County, San Diego. So I grew up as a beach kid. I was uh, a body surfer and d daily in an extremely boring American suburbia uh, to get to the ocean and be out and swimming in the ocean was an instant return to reality and to nature. So I would say the ocean was indeed my salvation as a, as a child and youth. But also it, when I was really young, it was orange groves only. And those orange groves were torn out at a speed of like five hectares a day, every day for 10 years. And at the end of that process, I was in a city when I had been in orange groves. And so it made me pay attention and I loved the beach. And then when I was an undergraduate and the age of you who are undergraduates, I went to the Sierra Nevada of California for the first time, California's mountains. It's a, about a half day's drive away. And this is one of the great mountain ranges in the world and it's, um, preserved as wilderness. Um, humans go there, but only as visitors, and they hike. And there are trails, but there's also vast parts of this mountain wilderness that are, don't even have trails. And at that point, and I, it's 
um, I was, uh, you know, 20 years old when I first went to the Sierra. And at that point, I, I, I forgot about the beaches and started going to the mountains. But it's all California. So it's a somewhat of an irony or a mistake on my part to be in Davis in the Central Valley. And that's why I emphasize the flatness. I'd rather be at the ocean. I'd rather be in the mountains. But they're both kind of nearby. And um, it's just part of being uh, in California. I'm very fond of the state. I'm very proud of California. And I like it as a landscape. Was there anything when you, when you first went to the um, Sierra Nevadas, when you were 21, I believe, was there anything in particular that made that stick in your mind so much? Well, um, the, uh, yes. My, my friends, the, we were hippies. We, were, uh, we had draft numbers in the Vietnam War. We were opposing the Vietnam War. I told you I'm a time traveler from a previous time, it's kind of fun for me to see what a... Because here's an analogy I've made to myself that I find rather mind-boggling. When I was your age, if somebody came to talk and I was an, an older person giving a talk to us and they began to talk about their youth, if you run the equivalent ages, I would have been listening to somebody talking about the 1920s. And... I tell you, in 1971, if somebody had started talking to me about the 1920s, oh, World War I had just ended and I survived the Spanish flu, it would have blown my mind and I wouldn't have been able to actually comprehend it or believe it. So I give this to you as a kind of a, uh, a mind-boggling gift that I, am, uh, I was your age in, uh, from 1970 to 74, extremely crazy times. So I say that because my first day in the Sierra Nevadas, I had taken LSD, and my two of my best friends were hiking up there, and we were as high as high could be, because we didn't, I mean, I have no idea how much LSD it was, because you never had any idea. It wasn't as if you could microdose or quantify. It was like, eat this pill or eat this uh, construction paper, a little bit of paper. So you eat this paper. God knows, nobody else knows what I had done. So this is very stupid. I, I don't recommend it. Um, I'm not saying it was smart, because it was stupid. But it was what we did back then. And, you know, you do what your cohort does. It's, um, it's smarter than getting drunk every night. It's a way better drug than alcohol, which um, everybody knows this instinctively. And so this first day in the Sierra, sorry to... Um, make such a long excuse for it. But I, I, this is what I say about it. That day, I went into a different reality, and I, I never came down again. I'm still on that same trip. It's, it was, um, they talk about this now in diagnostic terms, in therapeutic terms. Take LSD, and suddenly you don't have addictions. Suddenly you don't have end-of-life anxiety. I mean, why would that be true? Um, suddenly you don't have acute depression. That I find startling. I wonder if they will hold to that truth or not, because it's somewhat speculative. It's a science fiction story right now. But I have some feeling that it might be kind of right that um, your brain is getting slightly rewired. You're remembering it in the way people remember vivid experiences. Just in our ordinary consciousness, the more emotion you're feeling, the more you're gonna remember that, both positive and negative. Um, emotion is the memory spike. And so your daily life, you forget it because you eat breakfast, you go to the bathroom, you, you do your thing. Your memory doesn't hold on to that very well. Very few people have photographic memories, and it would be a curse if you did. But the, the spikes that you remember forever come from intense emotion. And um, that was a very beautiful day, wandering in the High Sierra. I thought I was in the upper reaches of the Himalayas. It looked like mountains out of one of these uh, fantasy TV shows. And in fact, I was in one of the lower parts of the Sierra Nevada, very modest mountains compared to the true High Sierra, but uh, I had never seen it before. And so it was a mind, it was, um, it was a life altering circumstance. And as I say, I've never really come back down from that trip. I, I have a kind of an elevated uh, uh, mountainous view of the world. And you actually have a word for this that you've coined, psychogeology or so I've read? Yeah, that's, that seems right. Um, in my book on the Sierra Nevada, I told this story and 
I, it's not a story I would have told until my parents had died because my mom would have been dismayed. So I, I didn't want her to know this story, and, but now she's gone. Um, so in writing about the Sierra Nevada, there is a thing that I call psychogeology, that our minds are shaped by the landscapes that we're in, and geology is a huge part of it. There is a term in England, psychogeography, but this is redundant. Um, uh, geography is already a human construct. That's what geography is. It's a human's relationship to the landscape. So when you say psychogeography, you are, it's tautological and you're not understanding what geography is. But geology, you know, there's psychogeology also. Interesting. Uh, sticking on the topic of nature and its conservation, uh, I think it's a good time to start unpacking the ministry for the future. You are visiting the Netherlands to promote the Dutch translation of the, this book, which you can buy over there at the Safe Office. If you had to describe this book in one sentence, how would you describe it? And it would be a long sentence. <laughs> the short sentence, this book is a mess. And that's literally the case. It's a, it's a bricolage, it's a melange, it's a, uh, novels can be, uh, have different formal structures and novels are very uh, flexible and capacious, and you can do novels that try to um, suggest uh, whole worlds. And science fiction is very good at that at the planetary level. So Ministry for the Future is a novel about the next 30 years or so, the global situation, the biosphere um, collapse that we are beginning, and it's telling the story of could we get out of the next 30 years without a mass extinction event and a s collapse of civilization. And if we were to do that, how would it happen? What would it feel like? And um, I want to suggest that that best case scenario, if you can believe in it, is the current version of the utopian novel. In other words, the bar for utopia has gotten really low. Given where we are right now, if in 2050, most of you will be alive, this is a beautiful thought, you'll be in the middle of your adult lives. If things are kind of stable, and, it, and you haven't had a mass extinction event, that's utopia. You could easily grow up into our 21st century version of the utopian history. Um, and it's gonna be a wild struggle, and that's one of the things I wanted to suggest in this novel. What might it feel like? Because again, it is a, novels are, are like um, geography. It's a question of um, human relationship to history it's a very emotional business. So it's a novel about that. That's a very long sentence, but you see what I mean. But what I think we'll, we'll touch on your views on utopia and science fiction later on as well, but what I think stood out to me and a number of your other readers is how um, skillfully you thread this line between fiction and nonfiction. And, but this has also left room for some critics to say that elements are not realistic. And we were wondering, did you even intend to be realistic? Um, well, I'm a, I'm a literature major. That's my field. And realism is a literary effect. It's a genre. Um, there is reality, but then there's um, humans' imaginary relationship to that real situation, that reality. That's what Althusser calls ideology. So everybody has to have an ideology. Um, if you don't have one, you are a disabled person, the various names for dis that kind of disability. But because there's an enormous onrush of information into your head, some of it sensory, you saw it and lived it yourself, some of it information through media, that onrush needs to be sorted and arranged for its importance and its coherence. So you have a cognitive map. That's what ideology is. So. Um, there is no such thing as realism except as a literary affect where the writer, say Balzac or Conrad, says, this really happened, and there's nothing in it that contradicts what you know, and you're thinking, ah, realistic people, there's no magic, um, realistic things happen in it, and um, it's claimed by the author that this young protagonist going through their life, that, it's as, as, that it is a realism. But the author's... Take Balzac, his royalism, his um, reactionary politics. That's in those novels. 
underneath the realism. So this is what my teacher Jameson calls the political unconscious. Every novel, sticking to that, has a political unconscious that infuses it and the choices being made. It didn't really happen that way, even if it was a biography or a history book, it didn't really happen that way. The author's concocting a narrative for you that has biases in it, has an ideology, it has to have that ideology, and you need to decode or unpack the ideology in order to understand what might really have happened in some uh, postulated way and what the author has injected into it as an interpretation. And that's the game of literary criticism. Now that we have chat GPT-3, everybody's become a literary critic and they know whether a sentence makes sense or not and it's interesting to talk about it. So everybody's now a literature major. I find this very fun. Um, but for my book, realism. Well, I wanted it to be plausible and I wanted it to a baby about this world, which is filled with bureaucracies and technocracies. It's a nation state system. It's global neoliberal capitalism. Those realities, uh, historical realities, and I think you can take the quote marks off. We do have a historical reality that includes those elements in them as diagnostics and even as structure. Um, Within those constraints, could I still tell a story of world history going right in the next 30 years, including the relationship to the biosphere? So solving climate change yeah. and solving the mass extinction event uh, as the two principal projects for society in our time to keep humanity itself stable. Could I tell that story in a way that while you're reading it, you never get kicked out and say, well, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. Now at the end of the book, Critics will say, oh, he's so optimistic, or people are not like that, or humans are just too greedy and stupid to have had a successful outcome like this one. Exactly. So, On the topic of the optimism, yeah. uh, one of your critics, uh, political scientist Francis Fukuyama, said that your novel was not only unrealistic, but too optimistic. Yes. So do you see that optimism as a weakness? I hope you remember who Francis Fukuyama was. Speaking of optimists... Yeah, exactly. At the end of the uh, Cold War, at the fall of the Soviet Empire, he declared the end of history. Oh, Western liberal democracies are the clear, obvious fate of all humanity, and so really the game's over, and I declare the end of history. I believe it's the name of his most famous book. So when he, I read this critique, and I laughed my head off. I'm thinking, how does Fukuyama even still get published? Because that is a very stupid thesis to be tagged with for the whole rest of your career as a supposedly good historian or anthropologist. I don't know him. I haven't read much of him. Essentially, he wrote himself out of history by writing the end of history. It was a ridiculous thesis. So when he says that I'm too optimistic, I just thought, well, you know, consider the source. I mean, who said this? Um, and, and indeed, I am often accused of being too optimistic. But I want to say... Uh, with Gramsci, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, that pessimism is cowardly and easy, it's a chicken shit thing to do in this time of history. Prosperous young college students should not be pessimistic because there are people that are struggling for food and for clean water on this planet. And so when, if the prosperous give up and say, oh, we're all doomed, you know, and so I'm gonna go party, then you're giving up on a, a, what might be considered a moral obligation or a historical obligation. And so optimism is like a club to hit people with. I am, a, oh yes, I'm an optimist. Well, I do have that biochemical advantage of my Sierra Nevada experience and I feel basically um, a, a glass half full kind of person biochemically. Very nice, but it's just, that's just personal. Politically, I'm an optimist by way of trying to hit people with the idea we need to do better. So, so, so that's what I want to say about that. I think that's a great time to start digging into some of the political policy ideas you propose in the book. The carbon coin is one that triggered a lot of conversation amongst policymakers, people in the literary world, world. And so we'll try to define it for you, and then you tell us if you agree with that. Good. We understood it as a financial incentive to reward the removal of carbon dioxide from the environment. 
and you uh, recommend to combine that with a carbon tax. Would that be mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. So this actually draws on real research by Delton Chen. Yeah. When did you first come across this research? I, I ran into that paper suggested to me by a friend around 2016 or 2017. And um, it, it, as a science fiction writer and a utopian science fiction writer, I've been looking for positive political economies and not finding them for the bulk of my career. So I'm always on the hunt for ideas of things that sound like they might work in the present world to make a better world. And I'm an anti-capitalist, and I think the profit motive, uh, um, shareholder value, quarterly profit, these are false rubrics that are wrecking everything. There's, um, it leads to inequality, it leads to biosphere destruction. I don't need to make that case, but I am on the hunt. How could this system be um, turned to the good without overthrowing everything, which I don't believe in either? So this instrument was interesting. Um, there used to be a gold standard. You had a certain amount of gold. It was worth a certain amount of dollars. That went away in 73. And it was always uh, fictional to begin with anyway. But if there was a carbon standard, and if we have um, several billion gigatons, uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, several hundred gigatons, a gigaton being a billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere, more than we should have for a stable climate. If you suck it down, you should get paid for it. Simple as that. Now, um, private businesses, okay, now I've got a block of dry ice, of frozen CO2, the size of this room. Who's going to buy it? Who wants it? Nobody wants it. It is not a consumer product. But when you go into a city and you think, does the sewage system work? Does this city have toilets? People want that. So drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere is a public good. It's building of a sewage treatment system and therefore it needs to be government-led, and then private contractors will probably do the actual construction of it. Yeah. Like the defense industry, like sewage waste treatment plants, government pays out of taxes, mm -hmm. private contractors get paid to do it. It's, it's not that different from our ordinary um, economic system, which is what I found attractive. Hey, uh, on that point of the economic system, I wanted to ask you, on the ladder of priorities, how important would you say a shift of our economic values is? to tackling climate change? Well, I think it's crucial. It's why it's the plot of the Ministry for the Future. We have the, the machinery, the technologies, the expertise. We don't have the money. Because if the economy is based entirely on extraction of value by way of profit and shareholder value, the 1% gets everything, and the world gets wrecked, and people get disenchanted or discouraged because they're not really part of the world system. So um, I'd say it's crucial and that we need a, a version of post-capitalism, but that's a radical and dangerous thing to say because it, it flies in the face of an international legal order that is firmly in place and backed by armies. So then you have to look for the, the leverage points, uh, like in judo, can I flip this system to the good? And we have um, the quantitative easing of 2008, and the quantitative easing of 2020 during the pandemic, trillions of dollars were injected into the economy by governments. It was fiat money, it wasn't crypto coin. And that quantitative easing, without creating massive lock, loss of trust in money itself, it proves that governments could say, and this is really the carbon coin in its essence, Every year, the central banks of the world are going to create a trillion more dollars than existed before. I think that that would not create inflation, and that that trillion dollars has to be spent on green projects, and mostly in the developing world, but really everywhere, to decarbonize, to drop carbon down, to clean up the energy, the clean transition, the green transition, and, and biosphere repair and, and um, you know, wild animal habitats. A trillion a year for for the next 20 years. And then maybe they'll want to keep doing it as part of the ordinary economy. Then you'd, you'd, you, it's kind of Keynesianism. It's, not, it's against neoliberalism, it's against market ruling people, which is like being ruled by an idiot, or a, a very simple algorithm that is a destructive algorithm. Instead, people take over and say, okay, as, as governments, represented governments, good political representation from their people, 
The people trust their government. This is as true in China as it is in America, or more true. And, and so those governments say, yeah, we're going to pay for green projects first. And then, uh, as Keynes said, there's a multiplier effect. That money pays for the green work. It goes into the general economy. It stimulates the general economy. You still have to play the finance games, the central, game, the central bank games of control knobs. Uh, can't be too much inflation. Can't be too much deflation. We need to financialize. We need to have monetary policy. It's all true. The world's too complex to, to simplify at this point. But you could inject those trillion dollars for green projects. So, okay, I'm an English major. I've just described to you in almost the full depth of my understanding this political economy. But since I can understand it, the general reader, it, it means it's comprehensible. Yeah. And the financial people, I've been talking to people in the last three years in the central banks, in the IMF, in the U.S. Federal Reserve, in the World Bank, and in uh, the insurance, reinsurance industry, and in the in private investment community. All these people have been interested in this book and this plan. And that luckily, it's not my idea, it's not even Chen's idea, although he did articulate it quite nicely. It's a world idea that is gaining traction. Yeah. It's, it's on the table, it's being discussed, it's being articulated uh, by central bank workers, by um, people in private investment who would like to be part of that trillion dollars a year, et cetera. It's on the table, which I report to you as a a good fact, and it's not just because I'm optimistic. It's because people are scared. People are terrified. If we lose control of the biosphere, if we go into towards a hothouse earth, mass extinction event, civilization will crash. Yeah. And so... I think this is... Yeah, sorry to interrupt. You. Everybody knows this. Yeah. And so that's why um, new and radical uh, financial ideas are coming onto the table. There is this palpable sense of fear. Yeah, I think this is a great time to take some audience questions because I'm sure people are very curious about the carbon coin at this point. Uh, do we have any questions in the audience? Ready? Yeah? Maybe we can get the microphone. How, yeah, it's working, thank you. Uh, how would this affect uh, socially? Wouldn't it deepen the inequalities? And is that something that you also tackle in the book? Um, it's a good question, and I think you all heard it. Um, I, just the day before yesterday, had a wonderful meeting with the economist Thomas Piketty, and he's all about the dangers of wealth inequality, that it wrecks everything else. And it is bad for everyone when there is the 1% that owns 60% of human wealth. This is crazy, um, absurd, ridiculous, and also not sustainable. So um, the carbon coin is one part of a much more complex set of solutions that's in the novel. It's easy to explain, it's crucial, but it's not the whole story. You need habitat corridors and you need justice. And so Piketty, was very, he had read this book, he liked it, but the part he liked the most was about wage parity. That is, um, the idea that the richest people on the planet should be no more than uh, 10 times richer than the poorest people on the planet, but also there should be no poor people. So there should be adequacy for all, you could call that one, and then the richest people on the planet would have 10, and actually, two days ago, I was delighted to hear Piketty be preemptively say, I think it should be one to five. So he's a radical. Um, you don't have economists saying things like this typically, and I've asked all of them, and, and they are weak on justice. Uh, they're like, oh, well, the world is the way it is, and we're quantitative analysts, and we do the economics, and you know, why should we change the world just because we're the one and only people who understand it? I mean, economists, as a rule, are irritating in their unwillingness to prescribe. They just are analysts, uh, quantitative analysts of an ethical system that they don't care to judge. Well, I, I'm irritated with them. Piketty was not like that. One to five, I said, one to 10 is easier to calculate, I said, and he's looking at me like, you are an English major, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but um, wage parity, and right now, what is it? Um, first of all, there's people who don't even have one. Like one out of every four humans is below one. That's 
unacceptable. And it's part of the reason for the general sense of despair and desperation. If Whether you're prosperous enough or not, if you know that one quarter of humanity is suffering, it's not good for anybody's thinking. A sense of dread and of guilt, of shame, etc. So you get the one, and then above that, um, it should be, let's call it 10. It's easy to calculate. Um, 10 times adequacy is ridiculous luxury anyway. But in America, in the world at large, it's more like 1 to 1,000. And so there are people walking this earth who have a 1,000 times as much as they need. They have nothing to do with that money. They try to become philanthropists or they try to become hedonists, and you just cannot possibly spend that much money. So they're mentally ill and often physically ill. I've met a lot of them, and I can say a mental illness is rife amongst the billionaires. They have the Midas touch. Everything they touch turns to gold, just like in the myth. So they don't trust anybody. They don't know whether they're real or not. They're alienated. Their billions have actually wrecked their lives. Well, take it away from them. You know, it helps them too, but it helps everybody else in the sense of equality. So justice is described in Ministry for the Future. The, the main action of the plot leaves that as an ongoing problem to be solved, but it's at least uh, described as part of the problem. I think we have one more question up here that we can take. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Liza Mega from the Political Science Department. I actually opened uh, this year's course on transnational politics for my MA students with a quote from your book in which you make fun of political scientists oh. <laughs> and uh, question whether it's really a, a science or, or not. And I wanted them to reflect on the type of political scientist they wanna wanna become. Uh, but the question I have for you is, uh, how did you, uh, because you use a lot of scholarship in, in, in the book, so how did you do your research? So I, I think that storytelling, whether it's, 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 it's novels or a podcast or other forms of art is very powerful to bring about political change, but, but how do you use uh, scholarship and research in, in a good way? Well, thank you for that. And I have some suggestions. The, if the, the internet is famously a fire hose, so you need to put some filters on to get the information to a, a rate that you can take in usefully. And good information is better than bad information. So I, I've signed up for uh, Nature Magazine's daily uh, e-briefing. They give you the five most interesting science stories of the day every weekday. Bloomberg Green does the same kind of a service, and these are both free for um, green business moves and also dangerous signals, but um, I've got a lot of trust in Bloomberg Green and indeed wrote a column for their print magazine. Uh, Society for Environmental Journalists, that's a little harder to get into, but they link you to all the environmental articles every weekday. Science News, a general science magazine, comes every two weeks, it's superb. I've been reading that for 45 years, and that the sense that my novels know a lot, this is partly a literary trick, and it's partly being a reader of science news for 45 years. It's good for a general, for everybody needs to be scientifically literate. So um, good, clean, and compact information um, is important, and I do that. And then, I mean, I'm married to an environmental toxicologist and work for US Geological Survey. I worked with National Science Foundation, so I've been inside the the uh, technocracies, the scientific federal agencies, from the inside I've seen them. And, I, and that gives me a lot of acquaintances to ask questions to, scientists. Um, my wife is like the least useful because if it isn't pesticides in groundwater, she won't even answer my question. She's like, why would I answer that question? So she's a very specific kind of scientist. And then I've been reading political economy my whole life under Frederick Jameson, which is a very particular tradition of Western Marxism, and so that gives me a political orientation to my political science that is um, simply Western Marxism. Uh, Sartre, Mer Merleau-Ponty, Levi-Strauss, Lacan, uh, Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze, uh, and, and then Adorno and Brecht, uh, Lukács. So, 
this is somewhat literary, but it's also somewhat political economy. And I always have a critique, and I, did, I do make fun of political science because I was on the environmental toxicology softball team, and we were playing the political science um, softball team, and I heard two toxicologists out in the outfield going, who are we playing? We're playing political science. What is that? And, and they, they tried to explain it, and they, and they started laughing. Like, Where's the science in it? Well, it's, um, it's kind of a human science, and, and I believe in political science, but it should be called political economy. And, but the science in it is a social science. All the human sciences have the same problem. It's quantitative, but it's also ethical mm-hmm. and human and historical. So you need to be doing something that's a composite. And if you pretend, like certain economists pretend, that, oh, no, this is purely quantitative. We know the truth of the world. We're just analyzing the real world with, as a scientist would analyze eclipses of the sun or some physical system. They are lying. That's ideological. They are pretending that the axioms are natural when they're human and constructive. You need to go back to the axioms. You need to admit, aha, we have some ethical goals here. We have some history here. Let's analyze that quantitatively like scientists do. Yeah, speaking of ethical goals, um, but also getting back into the content of the novel a bit, we wanted to really talk to you about um, how you bring in violent resistance in a very interesting way through the Children of Kali, but also later a black wing that was set up in the ministry. So for the audience, um, the Children of Kali are victims of experiencing helplessness under climate catastrophe, most of them. Um, And so one of those climate catastrophes is a heat wave that's described at the start of the novel, and that motivates them to assemble and take violent um, radical action. Um, Could you talk us through your thought process when you were initially writing this into the, into the plot? I wanted, well, I talked about this before, I wanted the novel to feel real, even though it was getting to a best case result. I wanted it to feel real. And this next 30 years is gonna have violence in it. And to uh, leave it out would be to reduce the realism of the novel. And so right now we're in the midst of two wars. It is not a, unusual thing to point out that we are in a a world of violence, but also a very important distinction that is um, exemplified or illustrated by the situation in the Middle East, there's slow violence. This is an important concept. The slow violence of the system that strangles people's lives, their hopes, their opportunities, leaves them poor, hungry, precarious, and uh, sick, and early deaths. That's slow violence, and that's the system we live in. Uh, We live in a system of slow violence, and you can take it for granted, or you can say, well, it's always that way, and it's always going to be that way. But those are excuses. It's not true that that has to be the case. There's slow violence, and people are going to get angry. Their village is going to die in front of their eyes, and they're going to want not just justice, but revenge. And and we see that. There's, There's intense, resentful anger in the world because of the injustice. And so I needed to have it in the book. The people who commit the violence in my book, they think they're doing right or they think they're getting revenge. They might be making the situation work, worse. The book doesn't judge that, but personally I think that um, my book would be hugely helped if I had read Andreas Malm's book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, which wasn't published when I wrote my book, um, to make a distinction between murder and sabotage. And, and if it's violence, it means hurting other humans. If it's sabotage, it means breaking stuff. It's not even violence. It's definitely not terrorism. You're simply breaking stuff. And if that stuff is wrecking the biosphere, breaking it might be a a moral imperative, but you don't want to go to jail for it, so then it might be a secret project. I mean, really, the rhetoric of action for young climate activists, I'm very hesitant to speak to that because it's super complicated what to do, what works, what's effective in changing people's minds and in changing laws, nobody knows. It's an experimental process. You try something and, and oh my God, the legislatures pay attention and the laws change. Or you try something and, oh my God, you're in jail for 30 years and nothing has changed at all. So I would say the question of violence brings up the spooky problem of physical resistance to slow violence or 
effective resistance to slow violence, which I think is a, a un, unsolved and maybe unsolvable except by experiment or trying things or mass demonstrations or you know the things that have been tried before that you already know about. My novel is very messy on that issue. It's not yeah. a good teaching device. Maybe if you had it to talk over for a long time, you could destrand the and use it as a discussion device. But it's not. Um, so moving it's not on, yeah. meant to be clear. Exactly. Uh, specifically in your novel, one of like the driving principles behind the violent resistance is to shock the rich and powerful into action. And there is a scene where uh, that takes place at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And you personally have been to COP twenty. Uh, COP26 in 2021. Do you, would you say that people in these positions of power and wealth are desensitized to the climate crisis? No, not at all. But here's an important place to make distinctions. The COP process is crucial to world history, and 40,000 diplomats from all the countries are getting together to craft a document that makes even stronger promises than the year before. It's slow, it's meticulous, and it relies on every country agreeing to every statement at the end of the year, so that's almost impossible. And the statements that come out of COP, every year they're required to make more promises, but do the countries back home keep those promises? Do people keep those promises? That's a different question. But if um, the COP system is admirable, and even having it in Abu Dubai with an oil executive as the president, irrelevant. The process will be the same and it's a good process, we need it, it's better than nothing. The World Economic Forum, known as Davos, is just a party for rich people to congratulate themselves for capitalism's great success in solving all world problems. Um, hundreds of prostitutes would be flown in from the Ukraine in the years, and bottles of wine were $4,000 bottles of wine drunk all night. It was a stupid, self-congratulatory capitalist party. So in my novel, they kidnap everybody. They take Davos prisoner and they give them a Maoist re-education camp for a week and make them cook their own meals and uh, et cetera. But it's a joke chapter and it's narrated by one of the rich people there. And, and at the, end, the, the rich people are not convinced well, by propaganda. But, but that's Davos. That is a, first of all, that's Davos before the pandemic when climate change suddenly became serious. Now, even at Davos, they'll have many panels on how good they are at solving climate change and what a big problem it is, and you need green climate change solutions that are capitalist. So even Davos is on board with the idea of the problem. They're scared too. They're smart, they're well-educated, they're wealthy, they're often well-intentioned. I want to insist on this. These are not villainous people twirling their mustaches and saying, oh, I'm rich, I'm on a fortress island, and I, I love it that everybody else is dying. That's not a real thing. That's a, a, a caricature or a cartoon version of a villain, like out of a cartoon or a superhero movie. The villainous, oh, I need revenge on everybody. There's some psychopaths and sociopaths out there, but the business community is well-intentioned. And green investment is a real thing. They just don't know that there are... Um, post-capitalist solutions that might be more powerful, there are public solutions that might be more powerful than their private wealth, that we need structural change, they often would deny that. Nevertheless, they're worth uh, arguing with and educating and persuading and not demonizing. And you can read Bloomberg Green, and I, I speak to investment groups now, hedge fund managers, how can we do ESG? Is it environmental and yeah. the social and governance, I think. Yeah. Um, how can we make money by doing the right thing, the green thing? That's a real movement, and there is trillions of dollars of um, investment capital waiting to invest and looking for the highest return investment that will still do a good thing. This is a true um, subject of interest to the financial, uh, to the wealthy of the world. So, uh, I mean, there are people who are obviously phenomenally rich who are thinking, I'm going to build myself a fortress in New Zealand, and then when the world goes smash, this is such a stupid fantasy, because when the world goes smash, their servants are actually going to kill them and take over. So they're wrong in like five or six different ways. Cory Doctorow is very funny on this when he writes stories describing this scenario. Yeah. So there are people like that, but they are in a minority, but they become media stars because they're being so flagrantly stupid in public that that makes you a media star. Yeah. 
I think this is a great time to get into. Yeah, uh, we thing. also had a, a one fun question where we heard on a podcast that you had with Ezra Klein that you would pick uh, Thomas Piketty, who you mentioned earlier, oh, yeah. uh, a famous uh, French economist who we've had on our stage before. Yeah. Uh, as, oh. your, yeah as your finance minister. Yes. Uh, if you were to con- uh, construct your own ministry for the future. So we, wanted to, we were really curious to see who else you would include in this cabinet. Uh, well, uh, I would have um, uh, Johan Rockström, a Swedish scientist who's at the Potsdam Institute, as Department of Energy or Department of Science. He is important. He's clarifying the world situation in scientific terms that are popularly comprehensible. He's the one that's made the planetary boundaries, papers, concepts in our head, planetary boundaries as a circle that we're blowing out of. So Rockstrom as Department of Energy. Maybe the, um, the women who got the Paris Agreement written should be head of the Foreign Affairs or Department of State. I mean, I don't even know. Um, maybe the ministry should have better department divisions than um, governments and universities. But uh, Christiana Figueres or Lawrence Tubiana, um, or um, maybe sign up Christine Lagarde. Yeah, is there, we were going to ask you, is there anyone on our wall that you would have as a part of your cabinet? We also uh, have Gita Gopinath, I think, Charles Michel, Mario Draghi. Um, a lot of these people I just simply don't know. It's a way bigger world <laughs> than uh, any one person can know. So um, yeah. maybe, I don't know. Uh, I'm picking the people I know, and I think there are probably other people just as good. Who would you have as the sort of figurehead for your cabinet, like a prime minister or president? Who was I thinking of? Um, what? I don't know. We need someone world historical. Um, you tell me. I, uh, who's um, prominent enough in the world culture that is also left or left liberal? Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe um, Beyonce. Beyonce, oh, oh Oprah, yeah, Oprah, Oprah. You need Oprah. <laughs> there we go. She would be fantastic. Or, you know, I wonder if Obama would come out of retirement and be president of the world. Uh, um, he wasn't the greatest president of the United States, but he wasn't bad either. He was a good, a good person and doing his best. So, a charismatic uh, leader. Also. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, closing up a little bit, I'm, I'm taking a look at the time. Um, your career, your career has spun 40 years, so you've been writing for a long time now. I think 1984 was the first time published. First novel, but first I had been novel. writing for like 10 years when my first novel was published, so and go, you, go way back. <laughs> way back, and you've consistently written about nature and the environment and also climate change, but our perception of the climate crisis has changed considerably throughout that time. Yeah. So how has that been from your shoes? How have your novels been received, and how's that changed? Well, I, I'm I'm a science fiction writer, but the kind of science fiction I write is now called climate fiction for a good reason. The near future science fiction has been transformed into climate fiction by the overwhelming impact of climate change on everything else in history. So at first I resisted. People would say, "Oh, he's writing climate fiction, or he invented climate fiction." I no, I'm a science fiction writer. I'm very patriotic about that. Science fiction is, of course, a nerdy hometown, but I'm proud of it. It's very good stuff. So I've had that impression that um, I've gone through three or four literary schools. Each decade has its own most fashionable literary moment, and I'd like to stay above or beyond that and just be um, permanently stuck in literature itself. Going back to Daniel Defoe in the beginning of the English novel, I love all that stuff, and that's what I want. But seeing the world, when I started writing science fiction was a subculture, almost like a ghetto culture, of a few nerds in the corner who loved thinking about the future and rocketry, and it was mostly men. And then the feminist science fiction revolution of the 70s was profound. Women science fiction writers are saying, you know what, if you're going to imagine difference, how about a world where there's gender equality? Let's write about that. And the you, 70s were blown up. You studied with or under Ursula Le Guin, if I'm I did indeed. She was a teacher and friend. Um, we did an event like this together in 2013 where we read to a college audience together. Awesome stuff. She was wonderful. And she taught all of us a lot. And she also began to blow science fiction up into the general culture. 
because her books were um, great and they were comprehensible. You didn't have to know secret codes uh, or science fiction lore to understand Ursula Le Guin. So she was crucial. And every decade until finally we're living in a science fiction novel, it's completely taken over popular culture, but uh, its literary track and its um, has, although it's always um, sneered at by literary fiction and by high culture, that is so retro now that it's, as, it's older than I am and it's completely defunct. We're in a science fiction novel, so then when you're a science fiction novelist, you're, I'm very much more at the center of this culture than I was in the culture of 1975 when I began. That's inevitable because the world has spun up into a science fiction scenario. Of course. Um, throughout your career, you've touched upon, obviously, climate science fiction. You've also written extensively about the extension of humanity as a species, colonization of space, Mars specifically, which you're known for. I think it's a, a good way to round up yeah. this interview would be to ask you if you think in your lifetime the science fiction you've written would catch up to reality or reality catching up to the stuff that you've written more specifically. No, and luckily I've never tried to make a coherent future history. Yeah. Like some science fiction writers, all their novels are part of an overarching future history so they'll go 50 years out, 100 years out, 500 years out and it's all one history. I have always rejected that. And um, I, I have to say, I wrote my Mars trilogy when we did not know that the surface of Mars is highly poisonous to human beings. I presented it as a possible utopian project. We go to Mars, we terraform it. It's kind of interesting. It was always metaphorical to life here. We, we terraform Earth also, and I wanted people to think about that. But since I wrote that book, it turns out that the surface of Mars is heavily salted with perchlorate salts that are highly poisonous to human beings. So my Mars trilogy goes from science fiction to fantasy. You know, my heart is broken, but it's irrelevant to humanity at large. Mars is irrelevant. And so I have to go around the world now saying, ah, oh, yes, the great masterpiece of the middle of my career. It's a fantasy novel. Don't be deceived by it. It can still be a good novel, but it is not a plan. And the, the billionaires who think Mars is a plan, this is just a crazy hobby of theirs. It's another sign of how uh, detached they are from reality. Um, but we, uh, so I have to go around. There is no planet B. Earth is our only home. If, we're, if the Earth isn't healthy, humanity isn't healthy. The stars are out of reach. I've written that novel. It's called Aurora. The solar system is really interesting, like Antarctica. And I love it, and it's beautiful. And we can actually get there and put little scientific stations and it's even, when we study space and the solar system, we're studying Earth also, and we learn more about Earth and taking care of it. So I don't want to renounce a space. I want to renounce the stars. That's just, those are bright lights in the sky we will never get to. That's not part of the human project. And meanwhile, Earth is sick. Civilization is therefore sick. Yeah. There's, you've got to sequence your, your goals in life. What do I need to do right now so that I can later do the things I want to do that's true of people, and that's true of civilization. Mr. Robinson, thank you so much for joining us on stage today. Are you actually working on anything else right now? Can we announce um, anything to you? I'm, I'm, I'm doing this uh, at all times for the last three years. It's, um, maybe you can tell. Um, it, it's turned me into a, a motor mouth without a control function, and I, and I'm, and I feel out of control. But as a writer, I'm writing nonfiction because it's a lot simpler than writing fiction, at least for me personally. So I'm writing about Antarctica and the plan in ministry to slow down the glaciers in their slide into the ocean so that this place in particular, this place would be deeply underwater. Um, and that's true of so much of the world, that slowing the glaciers down is an interesting real plan, and I'm writing nonfiction about the glaciologists who are working on it. So it's very cool, but it's very minor. Uh, well. It's minor for me as a project. It's major for the world as a possibility. If we could stabilize sea level, then you know Amsterdam wouldn't be, what, maybe 10 or 20 meters underwater? I mean, think about it. This whole country would be underwater. So there are issues to write about in nonfiction, and I'm just trying to stay sane. Amazing. So then we hope to see more of your writing soon, nonfiction as well. A uh, big thank you to the audience for coming out. Sorry for a little delay, but 
We're very happy that we had to have this conversation with you. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. I mean, uh, to add an extra lecture, I know this personally myself, to add an extra talking event to a busy schedule of talking event, that's like above and beyond. I'm very appreciative. I, I, I really, I thank you for coming. And uh, good luck with all your projects, really.